Welcome to the Compass Mining Podcast. On today's show, I sit down with Zach Bradford from CleanSpark. CleanSpark is a publicly traded mining company focused on renewable Bitcoin mining. And with the hot topics that are ESG, Rex, carbon credits, we also get into the Bitcoin mining arms race or the lack thereof. This was a really exciting conversation. I'm thankful that Zach was able to join me. Hope you all enjoy the show. Zach, how are you? Good to, good to talk to you finally. Hey, same here. Happy to be here. Yes. So, got a lot to talk about. CleanSpark has been you know, charging forward in this hot year of mining that was 2021. You guys have really uh, struck out and made a name for yourself. And I'm really looking forward to diving into more about CleanSpark proper. Uh, but before we get into the company itself, I'd love to hear more about your background. How did you get into this wild world of Bitcoin mining? Oh, man. And a, a wild world, world it really is, right? Um, you know, got into it almost by accident, um, but a good accident. And I think that's that's how it is for a lot of people. Um, so my background has been in finance uh, for my entire career. And actually, a few years ago, um, our company, which was doing energy optimization, um, and that's really where CleanSpark got its start, I went out to visit a data center, had no idea that the data center was focusing on Bitcoin mining and met with the founders about optimizing energy and adding more renewables. And, you know, did a tour of the facility, saw how things worked, and suffice it to say, I came away fascinated. Um, You know, COVID happened about three weeks later. So basically the world shuts down and stayed in touch um, with the the founder at the time, who now is our, our VP of Data Center Ops, and basically got to know more and more, became a Bitcoin convert pretty quickly. And, you know, when things normalized a little bit, you know, we were, what, eight months into, into COVID. Um, as a company got together, I met with the board and I said, hey, um, the opportunity is not to do an energy project, but it's to actually go into Bitcoin mining all in. And so we decided to acquire that data center. And, you know, since that day, we've invested a couple hundred million dollars and like i said going all in we prioritized the focus of the entire company so like i said it was by by accident but uh you know it was a very fortuitous and happy accident for us to come across absolutely and i definitely want to get into the esg renewables narrative and that conversation for sure Um, and i also want to talk about how clean spark differentiates from every other miner that is out there because there are there are quite a few of them Before that, I want to know more about energy optimization. So you guys started by helping data centers optimize their energy. Walk me through what that what that was like, what that was about. Yeah. So our our strategy was essentially that decentralized energy um, and specifically using your own energy behind the meter was was the way to go. So we'd done a couple data centers, um, you know, both with the military and in private. And the focus was adding on site renewable generation and storage you know, simply, you know, produce and use power when you have it, but also store it for when the grid power or your provider's power is more expensive. So you're really just using rate arbitrage and using cheap power when it's cheap, you know, and and saving the rest for later. It's a very simple concept, but yeah, done it at scale. You know, interestingly enough, though, as part of that strategy, the, the first time we bumped into actually cryptocurrency mining, it was a group in 2018 that were trying to go do a fully off-grid pilot scale. So we designed, it was only about a half a megawatt system, but it was mm-hmm. all solar, all batteries, 100% off-grid. So, you know, it, again, it's we, we all know that we're storing the value of energy in Bitcoin. And, you know, if we can store power cheaper and still produce the same Bitcoin, it's all the better for everybody. Absolutely. So you guys make this transition. You go from the energy optimization business to, I mean, effectively energy optimization in a different way with Bitcoin mining. Yeah. So there's there's definitely some crossover. But what is it about CleanSpark that really sets you apart from the others that are, you know, self-mining in the space? Yeah, you know, we we think it's about having our eyes wide open about what Bitcoin mining, you know, really is and how it is a store of energy. Um, you know, different than some of our other peers, we we don't think it's an arms race from a technology and a miner's point of like mining rig point of view. 
We think it's about managing your infrastructure and making choices with halving in mind, not just the 2024 halving, but you know the 2028 halving, making good decisions now so that we're here mining in 50, 100 years, right? We, we're really taking that view as a company. And with that, that me- means we're going to have technology change, miners improve, you know, the S19 is going to be the S9 of tomorrow, right? Sure. So whatever that looks like, we're, we're really excited, but we think it's about positioning ourselves for those opportunities rather than trying to buy more S19s than everybody else. So we're, we're a little bit slow and steady. Um, right now, I think we're the fifth or sixth largest publicly traded miner by production, and we think we'll see a few pass us, and then we think we'll catch them up. We have a tortoise in the hare mindset, and we think that that's going to pay off long term because, you know, it's it's with the amount of money we're all throwing at Bitcoin mining, you know, private, public, the the entire industry, you know, anybody that's not planning for four to eight years from now, it could be it could be scary. So, so how are you thinking about the halvings that are coming up? I mean, twenty twenty four, well, roughly, and they could speed up. I guess, yeah. but we're looking at roughly four years between. So how are you viewing these next two halvings and how that could potentially impact CleanSpark? You know, we, from, from our point of view, we, we see it as opportunistic. Um, we really have focused on, as you would expect, optimizing our energy. So our cost per kilowatt is really low so that we can really hang when, you know, other parties may struggle. We sure. think that it's going to be full of opportunities. Positioning ourselves well in 24 or, you know, whenever halving happens, it's going to be better than positioning ourselves for today's opportunity. Um, but we also still think it's important to focus on speed. You know, right now a hash is going to produce more Bitcoin today than even in three weeks, right, with difficulty changing. And so it's not ignoring the opportunity now, but we don't want to sacrifice it for the future. I think that we're going to see this huge makeup um, or, or huge shakeup happen at the time, you know, we're going to see some miners acquiring, some miners selling, and it's going to be, you know, we want to be the one that is growing and acquiring other miners that may have not stood up to halving. So that's, that's how we see it. We see it as a big opportunity and um, it's going to be all about the energy and where you're positioned. And it's funny you mentioned M&A. I'm surprised we haven't seen more uh, M&A activity so far in the mining space, considering the, the scale of the industry now and the different sizes of players that are within it. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Um, you know, I, I think we'll probably see if I was to predict, I'd, I'd say this year is going to be a year where we're going to see the first large scale transaction. Um, you know, somebody's going to merge probably amongst the public space. I think I read that there's going to be like 25 miners that are either public or going public, um, inside the next 12 months. So if that actually happens, it could get a little crowded and people are going to need to differentiate. So, you know, when that happens, we hope to be on the you know side of acquiring others. Um, I think right now, too, you got this really weird conundrum happening of valuation gaps, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's still new to the public markets and nobody knows how to value a Bitcoin miner um, right now. And then you also have all these headlines flying around by what people are going to have in 18 months. Some of it's going to be true. Some of it's not going to be true. Right. But all of that's like, you know, making it really hard to even create an environment for equal and fair valuation for M&A. So I, I think I think we're going to need things to settle down just a little bit. But I, I think it's going to create a very exciting, you know, next 24 months to see what happens. Sure. And I'm not going to ask you to get into the valuation of a of a Terra hash because I know that could be a, a, a sticky situation. But I think Galaxy Digital did a great job with a report that they put out not too long ago, a couple of months ago, maybe, where they took a shot at pricing uh, publicly traded mining companies. I think that was, that was a great resource, and it's a step in the right direction. You know, all yep. of this is it's trial and error, it's figuring out as we go. The industry is still very young, so it'll take some time to flesh out. Um, but it takes people like CleanSpark to you know be in the game, so that there there are people to look at. So you mentioned earlier that you don't think that mining is uh, is an arms race. You want to elaborate on that a little, a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So we, we see it as more of an infrastructure race. Um, and and that race, though, isn't about speed. It's more of a marathon, right, instead of a run to a convenience store. Um, and, and that's because if you set up your infrastructure wrong, you're going to pay for it for the next 10 years, right? Um, you know, if, if you look at the spot price market, which, you know, 
anybody that has Google can generally follow. Um, we've seen spot prices, you know, like last November, you know, they were really high when Bitcoin was 69,000, but as it's come down to back to where we are today, and the, the spot prices are down 30, 40% from, from what it was. So, you know, with the amount of machines that were also produced, we also believe that not everybody can plug them in. So it's about having a place to plug it in. If you have a mining rig with no place to plug it in, you have a very expensive paperweight. So we, we think that there's always going to be an opportunity to buy miners, whether you have to pay a little bit of a premium to get them today instead of in six months. But again, it's all about being able to plug it in, planning right. You know, there's there's actually quite a few miners that have pallets and pallets of miners that are just waiting to be plugged in. Now, when sure. they get to plug those in, that's great. That means they have this big stockpile. They can put it to use. But, you know, the amount of capital that gets locked up um, is is kind of intense to think about. So we really believe, you know, a, a miner plugged in is the only way to have it. How do you feel then about the spot market versus futures markets? I know some companies are very interested in these big future orders that are nice and splashy, but how do you guys think about the, uh, you know, those kinds of purchases? Yeah. So, you know, we, we have done some of those purchases and we feel like that's one of those, when you have certainty, you, you should enter into those and get more certainty um, for timing of arrival at set rates. And the way that they're set up, it's almost like a price ceiling and it can go down. But I really believe, you know, everybody knows there's basically one player that owns the market right now. But you look at now the announcements that are coming out, you know, Intel getting into the game, all the partners that are going to participate in that. Um, you just look at how, you know, Moore's Law about how, you know, technology develops. There's going to be some real disruption. And right now, you know, what happens in, in rig purchasing is, is not a normal way to purchase electronics, to pay for something and wait nine months to get it. Usually, you know, the other party would have financing arrangements or what have you. So right now, we think it's better to cool our heels just a little bit. You know, don't get me wrong. We, are, we, we have another 20,000 machines coming or already on a futures order that we placed in addition to all the miners we've already purchased. But on top of that, we haven't done what our peers haven't stacked on top because if I've got a contract for 100,000 machines to be delivered next fall, well, if there's some you know, earth shattering technology breakthrough that happens between now and then, I now can't take advantage of it because I'm tied up in this contract and I've made huge financial commitments. So now I have to accept what's maybe a second best miner. So we would rather just wait and we think patience will pay off. And then if it doesn't, and we still need to go buy, you know, a miner that we could pay a future order on today, later, we may pay a few more bucks, you know, per miner. But sure. we think that the trade off is well worth it to not miss out as technology changes. Yeah, certainly not tying up your cash flow and staying flexible is, is key. I mean, especially in such a competitive space. Now, with regards to the life of these machines, how, how are you looking at that? I know that the S9s have ran forever. Um, and now the S19s, you mentioned that they're going to become the S9s. What are you thinking of as the usable life of one of these machines? You know, realistically, we're, we're, we're hoping for, you know, five plus years, just like everybody. And I really think that from, a, you know, a Bitcoin production rate, I still think they'll be able to produce Bitcoin profitably for five plus years if you've, you know, got your power right, you know. Um, now, in year five, will it mean that you'll have to monitor your power a lot closer, turn them off, turn them on as difficulty, you know, is likely skyrocketed. But we do think they're going to have a really long shelf life. Um, but then it's going to come down to, you know, is there a midlife decision where you should sell those to a second generation miner and go buy, you know, whatever has become the, the latest and greatest? That's probably the strategy we're going to do is look at it as, Hey, if we can keep it on a shelf for five years, we will. If there's a good opportunity to roll them back out into the market and get something else, we'll also do that. Um, the good thing is, is because it, you know, is a Bitcoin producing asset. Um, there's a very robust spot market to to resell machines, so um, it's all opportunity, is how we see it. So, but I'd say five plus years for the nineteen. Got it. So. 
before we get into the ESG uh, conversation, I'd love to hear, you know, for the next 12 months, you mentioned you've got 30 or sorry, 20,000 machines that are on order that are coming in. What does expansion look like for you guys over the next 12? Yeah, you know, um, for us, what we've what we've basically, you know, and again, being public, we can say what's, what's public. Um, you know, we expect to have 4x a hash this year. And that's what we have under contract. We've got everything in place to make that happen. Um, but we expect to beat that by, you know, optimally many multiples. So, you know, but we're always working on something. So we our, our, our goal is to stay basically in the number four, number five spot. We're not going to go battle to be the, you know, one of the top three biggest. We think that that's, you know, got its own downside. So really, we're, we're looking at everybody else. We think it's important to keep up a certain cadence and pace. And as we look to see where other players are going to size themselves, we are going to try and make sure we keep up in that environment. So right now, we've, we're, we're looking at, you know, four megawatts or sorry, four exahash, um, which right now is about 200 megawatts of power. And, um, you know, but again, we're, we're, we have some big goals to beat that. Now, with the Chinese migration, we saw a majority of the hash rate obviously move out of China, and it's found a home, a lot of it, in, in North America. How do you feel about, you know, potentially us running into a situation in the next couple of years where 60 plus percent of the network's hash rate is located in the U.S.? I, I still see that as a good opportunity. Um, you know, the U.S. Is, is naturally a very competitive market. So I still think even if 60 percent of the hash rate falls in the U.S., it should still be very well distributed amongst parties where, you know, the 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 value of, of the Bitcoin blockchain and the decentralized nature of it still remains the security. I don't think we're going to see any one party, you know, holding an oversized amount of that. Um, and, and again, like I said, part of that is because we're all trying, you know, it's a good thing that everybody's trying to grow and keep pace with each other. So instead of one party having, you know, 100 exahash, we're all going to have 20, right? So um, I think it's a good thing. I ho- am hopeful um, that the regulatory side of the U.S. markets is going to end up in a really good spot that will allow the blockchain to flourish and maintain the independence and the value that it's created. Um, and I think it's, you know, the reality is I think it's better to have it here than some of the other places in the world who maybe if a very high concentration ends up somewhere else, um, it, it may not go as well. Well, and you mentioned, you know, getting regulatory clarity and hopefully things moving in that the, the right direction. You know, CleanSpark, I mean, your website itself says sustainable Bitcoin mining. Now, obviously, all of us have heard the the FUD and read the headlines about, you know, Bitcoin consuming as much power as the the country of Switzerland or the city of Las Vegas or uh, whatever the case may be. Why are you guys stepping out and standing, you know, as this this beacon for sustainable Bitcoin mining? Yeah, we actually think it's it's really important to be on the right side of the conversation in advance. If I was to guess where the regulation falls, it probably has to do with carbon produced related to Bitcoin mining. Um, you know, it's it's funny. You know, everybody talks about how much power used, and you know, n- not to beat a dead horse. Um, for lack of a better term, but, you know, how much, how much power are you using, you know, hosting selfies and things like that? Um, there's hundreds of megawatts that everybody knows connected to Facebook and Instagram and everything else. And I, I would argue, you know, obviously I, I think I'm probably speaking to the choir with both you and your viewers that there's far more value coming out of, you know, the Bitcoin and the blockchain than some of those other things. So I don't think regulation's going to come down on it in the wrong way, but I do think that there's a chance that we, we do see some big pushes for, you know, whether it's a carbon tax or something like that. And so we think that because there's a likelihood of, or a potential likelihood of that happening, um, we just want to be on the right side from go. We also see the whole ESG and sustainable narrative as something more than a marketing scheme. We actually do believe in it. You know, it's been at our core from the beginning, being in the renewable energy side, but I think that something that's different for us is we go into it with our eyes wide open. We see the limitations um, from a market-based approach that renewables have always had, right? Um, it's about payoffs to use power that's carbon-free. And unfortunately, 
you know, for a lot of our history over the last, you know, 20 years as a, as a country, it's cheaper to use fossil fuels than it is to invest in these renewables. I think that Bitcoin has positioned itself in this really unique space where, you know, whether we self-develop renewables or just sign up to be a backer for another party building renewables, we can pay for this. Our payoffs are, you know, amazing. You know, everybody knows Bitcoin mining is incredibly profitable. And I, we think a good way to pass that along is by making market-based choices to select renewable energy, even if it's half a penny more a kilowatt or something like that. And so that's why we think it's important. We want to be on the right side of the narrative. We also think that, you know, actions speak louder than words. So a lot of people are talking about it. Um, you know, some people say they're ESG focused. Sometimes being ESG focused means you look at the word ESG and you think about it, you're focused. We really think it means something. We think that it's about putting it into play. Um, and, you know, we, we, we can go into it as much as you want, but, you know, simply said, there's also other aspects to ESG and it all comes with trade-offs, right? The social aspect, you know, we want to pay our employees above average. We think that's just as important as choosing our energy. Well, if we make wrong choices and aren't successful, then we can't do that, right? We want to invest in communities, things like that. So all of that comes into being sustainable. And we think being an example is going to matter. You know, we the last thing you want to do is get called up to speak in front of Congress because you're the bad example, right? Right. Um, we, we, we just always want to be on the right side of the conversation. So now with ESG and this, this whole debate or narrative come carbon credits. Mm -hmm. So how, how are you thinking about, you know, consuming actual renewables versus consuming fossil fuels and purchasing those credits? I'd mentioned that I used the word trade off earlier. Um, with trade-offs, there's always something, right? There's an imperfect way, but something that's accomplishing a good purpose. We see that as how the, the carbon credits work. We focus first and foremost on directly the source of renewables. It's way, we believe it's far better to choose a carbon-free source of power from go and only buy you know, these recs for the balances needed. So that's what we've done. So for example, the first site, um, we chose nuclear power. It's carbon free. Yes, there's certain ways. There's a whole debate about, you know, renewable mm -hmm. versus clean. We actually see it as a, both a renewable and as a, a clean source of carbon free energy. So that's one, one way we've tried to tackle it at the source. Um, but, you know, do we buy RECs? Yes, but we try and minimize that. So if there's a site we're looking at that means it's you know, a huge amount of coal or natural gas, and we need to buy a ton of recs, we will pass it and go to the next site. Um, but renewables are intermittent. I mentioned living in reality, you know, wind, the wind's not blowing, you don't have power, the sun's right. not shining, you don't have power, all of those things. So we believe that being connected to, you know, a larger grid that uses multiple sources is the way to be a the most successful Bitcoin miner. With that, that means at different times of the year, depending on what's going on, there's going to be at least some sources of energy that may produce carbon. And that's what we buy the RECs for. But we, we really try and maintain a very high percentage of renewables first and foremost. And the RECs are secondary. You know, I think that there's also some interesting things that hopefully we'll see develop from a market based approach to create better incentives for. People, whether, you know, I think there's just better ways to do it than Rex. What those are, unfortunately, is, you know, very regulated by the government. Um, there's probably some interesting things with other altcoins or DAOs that could get involved to create some new opportunities outside of government mandated programs. But I think the market's got a long way to go before we get all the way there. So it's, I think it's, it's a split. Uh, a split conversation when you talk to Bitcoiners, right? When you're talking about ESG, you're talking about renewable energy. Um, I think that, well, I know that everyone that I've come into contact with would like to leave the world a better place than they found it. Yeah. Fund fundamentally, that you know that is, I think, an ethos that we all carry. The the challenge is that I think a lot of people don't see this move towards renewables or this push for for ESG um, to uh, to be that to be a, a net positive. So how, 
how do you think about this when you're talking, you know, you have a, a group of shareholders who maybe some are Bitcoiners, some aren't, and presumably they're all aligned with your vision for the, the company that you're building. But when you see the community um, that's really split down the middle on ESG, how do you think about that? You know, I think that it's important to look at the whole of ESG. So from an environmental point of view, we think it's important, but we also, we, we, we even agree that there's trade-offs. We just think that it's important to measure all your trade-offs so that you're not leveraging the wrong trade-off for, you know, to, in order to plug in more machines sooner when maybe you can make a different choice and actually build or invest in renewables and arrive at the same pl- same place, even if it takes six months longer, right? Um, but again, I think that if we take this ESG narrative, we're all talking about energy so often, and although it's important, we need to think about the S and the G, right? And I think if you think about the S, actually, that, that's, that's actually what I want to be part of our focus for the next year. You can't invest in the communities around you, right? If you're not profitable and if you're not producing Bitcoin and if you're not building and keeping up with difficulty. And so that becomes part of the trade-off discussion. Like we recently sponsored several scholarships at a local college where, where we have one of our operations in a computer science degree. We see that as something that's important to not only, you know, Sure, it's always good to do a scholarship. We had to have money to do it, so we needed to produce Bitcoin. But we also want to attract people that are going to school on computer science back into the blockchain space. You know, we think that adding Mindshare to the Bitcoin project is an important part of this process so that we can do it better in 10 years, just like we're doing it better hopefully today than we did it four years ago, right? So I think... You, you, you can't ignore and say, hey, let's let's pick the perfect scenario for energy. If it, if it comes at certain costs, then you can't do other things. And we think that looking at it as a whole um, is important. If you're not profitable, you're not investing back in the community. But, you know, you may not have a community that likes you if you're, you know, turning on a coal plant tomorrow. Right. So sure. you, you pick the right trade offs. And in that, I think you meet right in, the, in a really optimal spot in the middle where everybody wins. And I think ignoring one versus the other is is the wrong way to do it. We all saw recently that a letter went out from Elizabeth Warren to some publicly traded mining companies. Uh, are you guys preparing or looking at things in, in a different way um, as you feel this, you know, the, these questions from regulators coming? You know, I, I, I think that you know, if, if we said no to that, you know, obviously it would mean we were putting our, our heads in the sand. Um, so, but we believe we're already on the right side of the conversation. So again, we would actually welcome a letter like that to actually go back and say, Hey, here's, here's how we see the world. And this is what we're already doing. And we think that we're in a position to kind of help set the bar where it should be. You know, we have a pretty high bar ourselves, but I think it's an achievable bar and something that lives in reality. And so I think that that's sometimes the piece that's, that's missing is, you know, regulators and politicians, you know, they, part of their job is to put people on notice. Right. But I think opening up a dialogue, I don't think, I I think there's a lot more that we as a community could do, but also that the politicians, the regulators could do to be part of a dialogue to understand the benefits the blockchain brings. I, and, you know, headlines are headlines. And I think that there's probably too much of that that happens in our society where everybody chases the headline. You know, a politician that wants to stay in office, they better be in the headlines a lot, right? So, you know, we're, we're ready for it. Nobody, you know, nobody wants the letter, but if we were to get it, we, we are well positioned to reply. And yes, you know, our decisions going forward, you know, there are those letters in the back of our minds, you know, that they could come at some point in the future. Sounds like you guys should want the letter, you know, get, yeah. get one to you guys and have you uh, have you prove what you guys are doing to everyone and show them, show them how it can be done the right way. Absolutely. It's funny because it, it feels like most people are doing the right thing. Like they're, they're giving it the best shot to, to do, do right by, um, to do right by the community, to do right by the environment. It's just, it's just this ever present conversation. Do you think we ever break away from Bitcoin as a monstrous consumer of energy? You know, I, I think if we start to own our dialogue, it can be instead that Bitcoin is, you know, uh, the pathway to innovation, right? Um, somebody's got to pay for innovation, whether it's renewables or something else, right? And, it, and if we, 
if you ignore that, then again, that's putting your head in the sand on the other side. So I would be hopeful that yes, this huge consumer of energy conversation goes away because there's so many impacts that go into that. Like, hey, that means if we're consuming energy, there's jobs being created, right? Hey, if we're consuming energy, that means we can now balance the load in a grid. Um, all of these ancillary benefits come because we consume energy, not a, as, you know, and it doesn't happen without it. So hopefully the narrative changes. Um, and, you know, if, if, if we really take a proactive approach as a community, I think we can. I think that, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time, a little bit of effort. But I, I really do think that it's, it's going to shift over the next year and people are going to start focusing on the benefits um, over, you know, consumption at all. What do you think is going to cause that shift? I, I really think that it's going to come with, you know, just having a bigger voice. You know, right now, it's, you know, Bitcoin's been in the headlines a lot lately, but it's still seen as this fringe business movement. Um, but the reality is, is like I said, if there's going to be 25 publicly traded companies, um, there's going to be a voice for us, you know, whether it's on Wall Street or elsewhere to, to speak. We're going to have a, a bigger forum than we've had before. And, and I think I think naturally, as there's just a bigger voice, people will start to listen to that voice. Um, right now, so many people are just listening to one side or the other. There's the, those of us that are converts, and I feel like we get it. We get that, you know, this is worth something more. And then there's people that are still a little bit afraid. Um, I, it's just a lot of education, but I think that it's a matter of getting the voice bigger over the next year. Yeah, and it's fortunate that we're now getting more coverage. You know, it's uh, two years ago, you, you couldn't find out anything about mining without a deep dive in the internet. Now it seems like you can find a ton of information readily available. So when you're looking at expanding your organization, growing your team, how are you finding the the job markets right now with regards to attracting new talent? I know you mentioned your scholarship, but um, how do you find find it is to hire into the mining space? You know, it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, I would say it's a hundred percent better than it was six months ago. You know, there was still a little bit of you know people that didn't quite know if they wanted to go home and tell their you know their mom or their wife, hey, I just you know interviewed with the Bitcoin mining company because it was still. A little bit fringe. We're now seeing people reaching out to us and saying, "Hey, this is something I want to be involved in. This is something I believe in and I'm proud of." Right? Um, and so I think that it's the ability for the market's now matured to a point where somebody can go to Thanksgiving dinner and and, and sit down and you know talk to their grandmother about Bitcoin, and both parties you know have something or some exposure in common. And I think that it's this personal component that's actually had a, the biggest impact to the job market space where people feel comfortable getting involved and making a bet. So I'm finding it really excited. We're also seeing a lot of people, um, interestingly enough, like willing to leave a different career that had nothing to do with blockchain and move over. You know, we, we actually had somebody that applied um, for a position with us in for mining operations that had a degree in applied physics, you know, and they just said that they were kind of sick of this boring job they felt they'd had and they wanted to be involved in something that was cutting edge. And this is one way to do it. So I, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And that's what we're hoping is, is, again, as people get educated and see this as something that's fundamentally stable in the go forward, I think there's a ton of opportunity coming ahead of us. Absolutely. Well, Zach, as we come up on time here, what I wanted to get into is what are you most excited about? For the coming year, 2022, what's the the big, scary, exciting thing that you, you see coming for the future? Oh, man, you know, there, there, there's a lot. So, you know, something that we're excited about is, um, you know, actually how we've been doing our HODL strategy. You know, everybody talks about HODL and we're big believers in that, but we're using it. And, and it's kind of like this grand experiment between the store of value and actually using it as a, a, a means of transactional currency. But we're, we're big believers that can be bold. So I think we're going to see in this year that really prove out. And I'm excited for all these projects that are going on that's going to allow people in the communities to actually use Bitcoin more easily. Right now, there's, you know, with a lot of things, there's still one step between 
somebody using Bitcoin and somebody holding Bitcoin. And I think the more we can mesh that to where the utility value goes up, um, I think we're going to see the value of Bitcoin, you know, largely stabilize and continue its move back upwards. You know, the volatility is something that, you know, you have to have a strong stomach for if you're in in the, the, the space at all. But I really think as we start to transact amongst each other, because at the end of the day, Bitcoin's about people, right? It's about people being able to use something transparently without the bank saying whether they can or can't do something. It's the ability to move money to, you know, your, your family, whether they're in the U.S. or elsewhere. It doesn't matter. And I think that that's going to be something that creates this immense opportunity um, for Bitcoin in general. And I think we're going to see a lot of projects built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain as a result. So, you know, that's what we're, I'm really hoping for. You know, I think us as miners are there to support that. You know, we are the fundamental foundation for all of this infrastructure of the future. And I'm just excited to be part of it. And we're just going to keep trying to grow as and be as big a part of it as we can. It's awesome. Well, Zach, thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate you making the time to speak with me today. Before we go, though, let's let everyone know where they can find you and how they can get more information on CleanSpark. Yeah, absolutely. Um, find us at cleanspark.com. You can find us. We have multiple social media platforms. I'm usually communicating through the company platform. So you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, you name it, we're there. Uh, really excited to interact with um, anybody in the public that has an interest in CleanSpark. Zach, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate you. Hey, appreciate it. Thank you very much.